Hi, welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln. And I want to use this video to introduce what the Virial theorem is and why it's useful for astrophysics, basically. So it's very useful for the study of stars, galaxies, galaxy clusters, that sort of thing. Anything where you've kind of got a collection of objects like an n-body system. So a galaxy is going to be a collection of stars, dust, dark matter, all that sort of thing. And it has some kinetic energy as well, so they're kind of rotating these spiral galaxies, or you've got a cluster of galaxies, things like that. So it's very useful in the study, and we can actually use it to work out things like the mass in the cluster, the mass in the actual galaxy, things like that. So, what actually is it? Well, this particular theorem, in specifically in astrophysics anyway, because that's the context of this video, it relates your total kinetic energy, T, and the gravitational potential energy U of a system that's in equilibrium. So if the system's in equilibrium, we've got our total kinetic energy and we've got our gravitational potential energy as well. So the example here is we've got a galaxy group or cluster. So we've got uh, a few collections of different sorts of galaxies, really. They're all moving relative to one another and there's some gravitational potential energy associated with that. And if it's in equilibrium, we can use this theorem then to maybe work out the mass of the object, or the mass of the cluster, the dark matter, that sort of thing. So, what does it look like? So the Virial theorem is stated like this for astrophysics, so it will be two times the kinetic energy plus the gravitational potential energy is equal to zero. So that's how it would typically be written. So just to point out there, you've got your total kinetic energy of the system. So that's your T. You've then got your gravitational potential energy that's your U there. Now, if it's in equilibrium, then basically two times the kinetic energy plus the potential energy will equal zero. Well, that means we can also write it in the form, but down below there, so your kinetic energy T is equal to minus a half times the gravitational potential energy U. So we can write it in a few forms there, basically. But this is making the assumption that it's in equilibrium. We've got our total kinetic energy and our gravitational potential energy of the system as well. And that could be a collection of stars. It could be galaxies. But the system is in equilibrium. So the total kinetic energy of an n-body system. So again, if we've got a, a galaxy cluster with n number of galaxies, we can write the total kinetic energy like this. So we're basically summing up the total, or sorry, the kinetic energy of each individual galaxy. So here you've got the mass of body I. So we've got n galaxies in there. I is one of those galaxies, and your vi squared is, well, your vi is your velocity of that body I. And then we will do that for all of those galaxies in that cluster and sum it up and that would give us our total kinetic energy. So we can write the kinetic energy for the whole system like this here, assuming we have n bodies in there and I is a specific body. We could do the same thing for the total potential energy and we do that by summing over all the pairs. So this time round we're going to have a body I and a body J and we're going to work out the potential energy between those two and we do that for all of the pairs in the system. So here we've basically got the mass of body I, the mass of body J, we've got two bodies here, and then we've got the distance between body I and body J. And then we basically again sum that up across all of the pairs to give us our total potential energy. So this is again assuming that we have an n-body system with n number. The example I'm going to give kind of is galaxies, I suppose, in a galaxy cluster. So what can it be used for? Well, if we've got a galaxy group or a cluster, then actually the, the total mass of that cluster or galaxy correlates to the velocity dispersion of the group. So if you have a greater mass, it means that the velocity dispersion or the relative movements of those galaxies in the cluster is greater. So you have a greater spread in velocities as you increase the mass. Now, if you can measure the velocity dis dispersion, which we can do, then we can get a good idea on the total mass of the cluster or the group. Now, groups are just smaller collections of galaxies compared to clusters. Clusters are much larger and have more in them. 
and it makes sense that they have more mass. So basically, if we know, if we can measure the velocity, we can get the mass, essentially, using this particular theorem. What else can we do? Well, we can also measure the dark matter mass in a galaxy as well by looking at their rotation velocities. So if we, on that little graph down there, we've got distance from the center of the galaxy, we've then got the rotational velocity, and we can't actually directly observe the dark matter but we can observe the velocity. Now we would expect Keplerian wise for it to drop off, but we measure it to be fairly flat. That gives us a hint that we have dark matter. So we can measure the dark matter mass by the difference in velocity from what we measure to what we expect. What do we mean by that? Let's take a spiral galaxy. These spiral disk-like galaxies rotate and the further out from the center you get, if we use our expected Keplerian motion, so a bit like how the planets are, the further out from the system you get, you'd expect the velocity to be less. It should decrease. So that's what we actually expect. Same is true for a spiral galaxy. However, what we actually measure is that the rotation is far too fast in the outer parts of the galaxy. It's actually kind of flat. Now, one of the only reasons you can get that is if you have additional mass around the outside in a dark matter halo. So again, using this particular theorem, we can actually calculate the mass of that dark matter, even though we can't directly observe it. We can measure the velocity, and then we can work out what the mass would be from that. So we can also use it to find things like the internal temperature and pressure of stars as well, because stars specifically kind of on the main sequence in that, they are on, they're in hydrostatic equilibrium, which basically means their gravitational force, trying to collapse them, is balanced by their pressure. And we can, again, we can apply this particular theorem to work out internal structures, pressures, that sort of thing of a star. So it's applicable to a whole wide range of objects. So thank you for watching. And if you enjoy, then do consider becoming a member. There's extra videos in the member section, but it also helps support the channel going forward. So thank you for watching.